Hi everyone. Welcome to Lakshmi's Leadership Lounge. Um, this is all about future of work. You know, it's changing more than ever. And it's a time we evaluate the way we lead to prepare ourselves for it. So this is why we bring you a series of uh, leaders who showcase um, the way they're redefining uh, how they're leading. Uh, join me, Lakshmi Prathviri, on this journey as I take a deep dive into the lives of these trailblazers and their unique take on leadership. So for uh, this month, we are going through the theme of building communities at scale. So today I have with me uh, my dear friend, Virginia Sharma. She's the vice president of brand solutions at Geo Savan. And uh, it's a very powerful streaming platform uh, for South Asian music, uh, as well as audio entertainment. And she spearheads the company's global digital and uh, um, efforts across platforms that are responsible for uh, driving adoption to GeoSavant's advertising solutions for brands. Now, the thing about Virginia is that she has done many things uh, in her uh, life as a leader. She has worked in US, Singapore, Japan, India, uh, and she also worked with large companies like IBM and LinkedIn. And she brings over 20 years of experience in leading marketing and sales teams. Um, and uh, so you'll learn more about her uh, as we talk. So with that, I'd like to bring uh, Virginia uh, to join us. Hi, Lakshmi. Hi, Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. So let's have a nice chat this morning, my time, evening, your time, night, somewhere else. You know, we are in a global <laughs> scenario where it is some time for somebody somewhere. So, uh, you know, you should know most about this because you've been like one of those leaders uh, who's had multiple roles for 15 years at IBM and then at LinkedIn. Uh, you were like a digital nomad even before there was a term <laughs> called uh, digital nomad. So um, tell me a little bit about uh, the places you have worked and uh, despite working everywhere else, you keep coming back to Asia. So tell us a little bit about the draw to Asia uh, and uh, your life as a digital nomad so far. Yeah, uh, you know, um, I, I joke that uh, this is my fourth innings in Asia, and I have uh, plates that have traveled to Asia more than some people have traveled to Asia, because I, I go back to the U.S. with my plates, and then I bring them back to Asia. Uh, but yeah, no, look, um, I started my career in 1999 with IBM, and the funny thing is, is that I started as a uh, work from home or remote employee. We were given a laptop, and we were given a pager, and we were given something called a token ring where you could dial yes. in, right? You had to I remember choose. that. <laughs> so you had to choose whether you would have to be on the phone or whether you'd have to be online. And yes. I think that was a great experience because obviously I got many years of training of how to work as an employee, but also be a manager of people in a remote environment before Zoom and video. Um, but through that environment, I got to interact with people all over the world uh, early on because, uh, you know, you can work at different time zones, etc. And I got my first break to move to Asia, uh, you know, a couple of years into uh, my career. And I moved to Japan, which is probably about as Asia as Asia can get. Actually, it's about as Japanese as Asia can get. And um, I'd never been to Japan. But the important thing was is that uh, suddenly you realize that you know, the world uh, doesn't start and end with the U.S. And when you've been trained as a, as a, you know, go to undergrad in the U.S. and there's a work ethic, uh, you really have to recalibrate uh, how you work in Asia in terms of relationships, in terms of how to get work done, how to relate to people. Uh, the gender relations in Asia are very, very different. Um, so I think that that was a good training early on. I was uh, not very good my first Asian innings because I brought an American sensibility to Asia, which never works, but I think it served me well for my next three innings when I came to Singapore, when I moved to Mumbai, and uh, now when I moved to Delhi, uh, to yeah. be a little more um, aligned with how to get things done here. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about 
in all these years, how has Asia changed you? And how have you changed? Yeah, I mean, look, um, the one thing is that when you actually build for Asia, uh, you build for multiple cultures, languages uh, from the beginning, right? So this idea, and I always used to tell my team in the global team, when I went, went back to the U.S. after doing my stint in Japan, I was mm -hmm. part of the global team. And I said, let's not build for the U.S. and then try to scale out from there. And that's one of the mistakes that I think a lot of startups do, which is they take an American or Western model and they think that they can kind of extend it here. I would tell them, you know, build for Korea and, and then scale it to other markets because if it works in Korea, it's going to work everywhere. You know, you've got double bite languages and everything else. So it's much more complex to make it work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's going to be a lot more applicable everywhere else. So the number one thing was like my, my playground was no longer, let's try it in Chicago or let's try it in Detroit or let's try it in Miami. Uh, you know, it used to be you do, you know, New York, San Francisco, you know, LA, and now you start, that was the idea of trying a test market. Now my test markets were, let's try it, you know, in, in um, Indonesia, let's try it in Korea. So that's one, which is just changing my center of gravity. And the second thing that actually really changed for me is understanding how to use my dual cultures very, very well to get things done. You know, I have the benefit of being Asian. I have the benefit of being Indian. And mm -hmm. so the ability to relate to people uh, through your Asianness, um, when you have a relationship building, uh, you understand how it is to work with uh, people who value family, who value, I mean, the number of customers I've had who've tried to set me up with their sons or uh, <laughs> sisters, sons or you know, uh, when I was younger, but taking it in stride and not being offended by it and understanding the sentiment behind it, uh, yeah. all the way to saying there's a line to say, all this is fine, but I'm also an American and there's certain, uh, certain professionalism, certain work ethic that I have that comes with my American training that I bring to the table. So I became very good at kind of using both, uh, both pieces. I think what I changed in Asia, honestly, is the ability to bring uh, great habits. You know, I think that there's something about learning to work in the U.S. is that you really focus on processes. And, you know, one of the most important things I learned is when you commit to something, um, you deliver. You don't just sort of say, uh, I'll get it done. It'll happen. And that's one of the things about Japanese culture and Indian culture, which is like, you know, an, a, a nod doesn't necessarily mean agreement. It means that I understand right. what you said. Or in Hindi, as they say, there's sort of a, a gray zone of, of will it happen or won't it happen? And I think that the ability to bring some level of accountability and commitment, I think it's important. I think it builds our yeah. credibility in the world. Correct. Yeah. Um, and also you have worked in um, large companies. You've been at IBM, you've been at LinkedIn, and then you decided to move to GeoSavan. So you worked in international companies in US, international companies in India, and now kind of an Indian international company in India. So what yeah. would be your advice for young people who want to switch? Um, and you've done it where you've been very solid in one company for a long time also, but you've done many roles in that company as well. So you've not been like the same job for, you know, 12 years or anything like that. So what would be your advice to young people? I think oh, the best advice I got. Anyone who wants to switch. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think the best advice I can give people is make at least, and I, this is the advice I got, which is make at least three changes in the first 10 years of your career. Whether it be changing, if you're in the same company, change location, uh, change offices, change departments, change functions. Uh, change cities, um, just the ability to build that sort of agility in adjusting to different cities, different cultures, uh, different lines of work will make you more ready for what's to come when you go into your 30s and you're faced with more change because you're going to take it into your stride. It's not going to be 
as big a deal when someone says, well, the next big opportunity for you is in another market. And by then you're potentially in a relationship and you have things holding you back. And, you know, uh, people always tell me, it's like, you know, you used to live there. What do you miss about that? Or what do you miss about IBM? I don't miss anything about anything because, you know, you just keep, you just keep going and everything had its moment in time and everything was good for what it was, but I don't hold on to it as, I wish I could go back. If I really miss IBM enough, I'll make a couple of phone calls and try to get back there. If I really miss New York enough, I'll get a flight and I'll go. But uh, the idea of impermanence is good for people. And I think that change is really healthy for people in the first 10 years of their career, even if they stay in the same company. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, You know, I mean, people say, oh, you worked at Intel for 12 years. And I say, yeah, I had, but eight distinctly different jobs so yeah. i learned so much uh, you know and that's the advantage of being with a large company sometimes is that yeah. you can change locations you can change jobs you can change divisions you can change functions uh, etc yeah. um you know the other thing is uh, the sense of home uh, you know virginia on one hand we are getting into a world where a lot of the young people say why do i need to own any home at all and i just will be you know, Airbnb forever, probably, or uh, maybe is it a certain time in your life when that changes? And uh, you also talk about home and ownership. It's an integral part of Asian conditioning. How is that changing? How have you changed about it? What's home? How do you define home and ownership of home? I mean, honestly, I think I'm probably more Asian in this than not. You know, I, I think that my dad, um, made some brilliant investments um, in owning home. You, you know, we grew up in Dubai, so we never owned our home in Dubai. And I think that that had a lasting impression on me because we uh, had a place in Mumbai, we had a place in New York, but we never had a place in the place we grew up in. And yeah. it's because at, back then you weren't allowed to own the place. And I think what really stayed with me is when I came back one summer, our home was raised because they were, we moved and the place that I grew up was being, you know, they were building some new construction, which you can do when you uh, don't own a place. And I think that that, that that kind of had a lasting impact on me to say, I need a piece of space on this earth that I will decide when it has to go. Um, mm. Or someone has to ask me before they destroy it, I guess. And so, yeah. um, you know, I think that uh, the home that I live in right now is actually an apartment across the street from my mother's. And mm-hmm. these were two flats that my, my dad invested in almost 20 years ago. I don't know if he had any idea what would happen to him, what would happen to her, what would happen to me. But at the end of the day, it's COVID and I get to walk across the street to see my mother. So I think the idea that uh, this grounding, of, it doesn't always have to be the same home, but I do think having, having that anchoring has been good. Um, but, you know, on the, on the flip side of this, I, I have no problems Airbnb being my apartment. I own a place in, in Sri Lanka. I have no problem others sharing that space. You know, there's a great word in Hindi that my mom would always teach me, which is barka, which is a house that people come and go from is right. a home. So if you build this beautiful house and nobody comes, then is it really, is really worth it? So right. I love having just people come, stay, go, um anytime because i think that's what makes that place and and i think that that's what you want if you have the means to own a piece of real estate in the world own it but then open it up to to everybody i think it's great and i always call this idle capacity sharing you know so if you have a home a bedroom to spare or whatever have, give it to your friends and you know someone and i'm traveling all across us and that's what i've been doing is you know, my friends who have homes that are not being used, or, you know, it's, it's wonderful, oh, sorry, uh, wonderful to do that. So um, from ownership, let me move a little bit into, you know, we are talking about, uh, you know, concrete things now. So what are your success metrics as a leader? You know, I think uh, for me, the ability for us to have one conversation in the organization versus two or three conversations. What I mean by that is, you know, there's a academic term. I don't really like it, but I can't think of anything else called psychological safety. 
but you know, if if your singular goal as a as a leader is to make sure everybody feels comfortable saying what's on their mind and the ability to have one conversation across the organization regardless of the level. It's very difficult to do in cultures like in Asia because there is a hierarchy, there's a respect for authority. And so being able to let people talk about what doesn't feel right or whatever is a big task, right? And so I think number one for me is when I get to a point where there is psychological safety, where every level of the organization can get feedback and can talk to each other, can raise issues, our ability to whack-a-mole when you know the issues up front is so much easier than when people give it to you in exit interviews or you read about it online. So to me, number one is creating psychological safety on teams is number one success metric. The second thing for me is I am unabashed about my team making a lot of money. And what I mean by that is I'm in sales. And I think that people underestimate how good people feel when they see success in sales, when they beat, when they crush their quotas, that gives them a swagger, gives them a confidence to take bigger risks. And success breeds success in sales. You know, uh, you can see people's body languages when they bring in a deal. Like it's, it's so, so reinforcing. And people want to be surrounded by other high performing people. Right. And so they want to pick up their game. And so I always say, you know, my goal is that you make a lot of money. And for us not to be embarrassed about the fact that money motivates us to sell the market. Um, and so I think that when I see more people on the team, and I don't mean one, one big hitter makes a lot of commission and nobody else makes money. I mean, like, it's a little bit like when you're playing gambling. And my sister always does this. She, she's one of the best blackjack players because. She always celebrates when anybody beats the house. And she always says, you know, everybody wins, everybody wins, dealer goes bust. And so I always love this idea that everybody makes commissions, everybody wins. Because it's so much more fun when everybody gets that check, right? And you, you get to do that. So I think that's the second one. And the third one for me is, you know, I don't see myself as a marketing leader or as a sales leader. I see myself as a business leader. And I, you know, you see this on my LinkedIn, which is I really see myself, I work for companies where I believe in the culture and values of companies, whether it be IBM or LinkedIn or here. I feel very aligned with the culture of the company. And I want to be known as a culture champion of the company and the ability to actually live the culture and values is very, very important. And so, yeah. you know, when we stay in Geo Salvin's culture, we're people first. I want that to show up where people meet me, see me in action, see our cultures and say, yes, she works here. This is aligned. That authenticity and that alignment for me is so important because otherwise it's just words on a paper. So I think those would be my three success metrics for the leader. And I, you know, the last thing I want you to talk about is you talked earlier about what your dad taught you about success. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that before we shift to the next section. Yeah, you know, my dad, um, and unfortunately he passed away when I was 28, but you know, we were first generation going to uh, working and he would always say, I'm never gonna be right in front of you. I'm always gonna be right behind you. And, yeah. you know, I would have so much envy for some of my friends who had, now I know the word helicopter parents. They would always be around. They would always stick things and sort it out. And my parents would be like, figure it out. Like if it's really bad, we'll step in, figure it out. And I think this idea that for my team, I don't want to be in front of them, but I want them to know that I always have their back in case it goes, goes, goes awry. And just building their confidence is, is that really what I hope to do. So always being right behind them, but not necessarily right in front of them. So now we get to the section where you get to ask me questions, stump me if you can section. So I love it. Ask me. My favorite part. <laughs> I've been I've been waiting for this. So actually, yeah. I mean the ability for you to build an entire life after seeing success. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I meet a lot of people that they have seen success by the time they're 30, 35. But then, they, you know, they realize or even 40 or 45, they realize like, wow, I have so many more years of yeah. active life left in me. What do I do now? So how did you navigate this idea of life after success for you? I mean, you've 
done so much, but that moment that you left Intel after 12 years, you'd yeah. already seen success. So how did you figure out? Yeah. You know, to me, um, I've learned also from my father, it's funny, we both talk about it, is that success is not a destination, but it's a journey, uh, you know, and, and success is not about you. It's about what you can do for others. And uh, um, so I always felt, you know, there are people who told me that don't ever make your passion your profession because you know when you're professionally doing something there's a lot of ups and downs and even the one thing you love now has become a headache uh, you know but for me I always felt the best measure of success for me would be doing what I love my passion to be my profession because then there's no end to it it's not like this journey is over when this job is over for me, it's a journey. So I feel whatever I'm doing with ink, you know, I don't know if ink is sold tomorrow, I'll start pink or whatever it is. What I am doing is what I want to do. And uh, so there is no end of, I've been successful, now what do I want to do? This is what I want to do till I drop dead. You know, I mean, there's just nothing else I can think of doing. So to me, I guess success is, you know, wanting to do whatever you're doing. And even with Intel, if I woke up in the morning and felt, oh my God, do I have to go do this? That's the day. I mean, I never let that day come. You know, I always change jobs before that happened. So even within Inc., it's not like it's one company. What we do has changed. How we do it has changed. Who is doing it has changed. And now I'm letting others do more and I'm focusing more on, I want to have a talk show like this every day and not do anything else, you know? So this is what I love doing. So I feel I designed my life. So success is just keep on doing whatever you're doing till I, I, I keep saying, I want to be like Abdul Kalam, you know, stand on stage someday talking for that, you know, that be success to me is till the last day do what I love doing <laughs> and making some money doing it not just for me but for the whole team I mean what you said is very very important it has become very important to me um, you know coming from a very socialist uh, father and a very you know kind of thing I always used to think oh making money it's like uh, you know it'll happen uh, now I'm like no I want everyone in my team to be financially very very successful so that's what success is, making others successful and feeling like it's a journey. Then it's never ending. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing because along the way, not only have you kind of had this life after success, there are people who you've kind of brought out from, uh, you know, I don't know where you find them, to be honest, but then they've made movies on them and you've made. So, yeah. so you know, we, we know about the folks that actually you know, come on stage with ink. It's always been such a source of inspiration for me. Has yeah. there been people that you wish you could actually bring their story out, but they have been reticent to let you or give you, invite you into their space? Does that happen or is everybody ready? You just need to find a way to... Actually, that's, uh, you know, people don't sometimes understand how great they are actually. Because when I tell them, hey, you should tell this story, a lot of times, especially in India and especially in Asia, oh, but what, what's so such a big deal about this? Everybody does it. Um, it. It's that there are times people are reticent to tell their story because they feel the story should be something like I made a billion dollars. And, you know, somehow we've made success to be very, very wealth oriented, but not contribution oriented. So, so a lot of times people say, what do I have to say about this? You know, I'm like, oh my God, the way you're growing your garden is like so unique. You must tell how you came up with this idea. So I think we need to, as observers of people around us, it's our job to find the stories in whatever they're doing that may seem most ordinary, uh, but make that really to show them how great they are. So otherwise people are always looking for someone else who is great and not looking at themselves. So I think it's our job as storytellers 
to get extract stories out of people and get them to tell the stories. It's not a journalistic thing of me telling that story. It's to make them get that limelight. And now my focus is, I have done that for, for the world and I realized that I need to do that more for my own team. So I said, I have a leadership team now. I want each of them to be out there speaking. I want each of them to become superstars. Uh, you know, otherwise in the company, even a big company, you only know the CEO. You don't know who are one level below. So I think it's important to have multiple spokespersons for a company that are equally good. So you kind of say, oh my God, look at how many amazing speakers are there. So that's become my thing of my team members should be known more. While this kind of a talk show I do is what I do, but I want them to do other things. So, you know, people write about them and, you know, they just become storytellers also. Yeah. Yeah. So my, 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 my one question is, I think I, I am, I can ask one more and this is so much fun. I've never gotten to do this um, is, you know, you have always been a curator of stories from across, um, across functions, domains, countries. If you had to give an ink talk and if you were an ink fellow, what will your talk be about? Oh my God. That's a tough one. Um, I think, I think it would always be about um, why it is important to stay positive no matter what. I think I'm, I'm fascinated about finding the story within you. We always look for, uh, you know, inspiration from somewhere else, success from somewhere else, etc. But the real story is within you. Uh, I always, you know, I think, mm, whatever I say, it doesn't matter to who is about giving them the space to discover their story. And um, maybe really is about how we each need to be a different kind of a storyteller. A lot of times people confuse storyteller means you are the center stage, but storyteller is bringing the stories out in others. And maybe that's what my talk would be about and how to create a world where you make it easy for others to see the story within themselves. Um, yeah, I, hope I mean, they remember you. <laughs> but, but the more important thing is they should discover that aha within themselves. Which is amazing doing. because your ability to be this amazing observer, listener, isn't that, I would say, you know, coming back to the point of corporate skills, I think listening is everyone, every leader I know, barring a few, is sort of a terrible listener. Yeah. All of us. Like we're working on it every day and they always say you should listen more. Uh, how do you force yourself to, to hear stories as you're trying to extract? You're so extroverted. You're so dynamic and inspirational yourself. How do you quieten yourself to hear? I think, you know, part of what I do is the importance of balancing the quiet time with the talk time. You know, I have to go for a walk for an hour or be quiet for an hour every day. I read a lot, which is a very in, inward focus thing. Um, I just want to say that, you know, when I was in MBA program, I'm actually in Portland, Oregon right now where I went to school. I, we are going over time. So I just want to excuse myself for a second because I have to say this is that because it just occurred to me is uh, my final thesis for my MBA program was a school I would start called Esperanto which is a universal business language and it would be to teach business leaders about theater because I majored in theater with the minor theater arts and I wanted to you know travel all over the world work with the best leaders and teach them how to be great uh, storytellers. I mean, that was my uh, thesis for my MBA program. And full circle after all these decades, and that's really what I'm passionate about because I feel corporations today are the biggest economies. And uh, if I can influence large corporations, the leadership of large corporations, to think differently about what work means, what teams mean. If I can make them discover 
that um, you, you know the matriarchal part of themselves because I think business has become too patriarchal over time in terms of how we should work. Doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you know, you are supposed to know everything, you're supposed to do all this, etc. But really it's about saying, I don't know, teach me something, let's do it together. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very, very matriarchal way of dealing with things. So to me, it's so interesting as you asked this question, I was thinking that I'm in Portland, Oregon, and right now my passion is exactly what I said in my business graduation thesis is what I wanted to do. So right now my passion is, I believe in the ripple effect. Either I can be known for a billion people that a billion people know who Lakshmi is, or I work with hundred people who are the most influential and, you know, billion people each know who they are, but I get to influence the way they think so they can create a better world. So that's what excites me is to work with leaders like you and say, how can we make you more successful? Because you can actually address a billion people, which I really, I'm not good at. So it's, it's very interesting. But anyway, we are running over time. So I really do want to say that the one thing, Virginia, I want to wrap up by saying that um, we have something called a ink tree seed moment where we would like to plant a seed between us. Otherwise we have this great conversation and you know, we'll never talk to each other again, never happens. But an idea that we can work together on and I want to plant the seed in your head that you know, all this talk show that we are doing right now maybe or some of the talks we have, it'll be great if we can work with you to see how can we bring this onto the GeoSavan platform and what can we do together? Um, what do you think? What do you think about that idea? I mean, I love the idea because I think that uh, one of the things that's missing, I, I listen to several podcasts on uh, work and the future work. I think Adam Grant has one and, uh, uh, you know, there's a bunch of them. But I think that the context of, of Asia for me is missing from them. So it's a great opportunity to bring yeah. some of your network, our network, because the GeoSavin audience is the most aspirational audience, right? A hundred million uh, largely South Asian Indians, uh, you know, given the education system and given the, the career coaching that's lacking, right? The soft skills, they always talk about soft skills, soft skills. I mean, this is, this is the yeah. soft skills, what you're talking about. And yeah. it needs to reach, not just to your point about, um, the thousand people that influence the next, which is, I think that, uh, more of India needs to, to, to see that. I mean, we were very lucky as, people attending the Inc. conference, you know, a few hundred of us that changed our lives, but we need to democratize this positivity. And I think that that would be a great opportunity. So, uh, yeah, so I think we need to, really we need to make it to happen. That. Let's do something together. And the, thank you so much for your time. And I just want to say every time I talk to you, I walk away energized. And one of the blessings we all have in our lives is to have great conversations, positive conversations. So thank you for that. And we'll thank talk you for more. Me. And uh, thank you. I want to thank all the audience. Sorry, we went a little over time, but it was a great conversation and I couldn't stop. And uh, thank you so much for your time, everyone who's listening. Bye bye until next time. Bye. Week.